Thanks, Amanda. Really appreciate being in Seattle and enjoying this cool and wet weather. Um, I uh, um, want to discuss a concept today. And right off the bat, when I looked at the title and I saw the word new in there, I thought, wow, there is nothing new. I don't know if anybody listens to TED Talks. They were talking a few weeks ago or on an episode about how there was really nothing new in the world and that we just sort of reinvent stuff. And so this is not new. Uh, this is taken whole cloth from uh, the New Zealanders and from the, the uh, British Isles. And so with that, if you're, you know, if, if you have to have new, you need to go somewhere else. But um, it, it is a good concept. Uh, what we have some preliminary data, but it's a mature, mature technology and it's used successfully um, in different parts of the world where it does this, where it rains um, frequently and it, uh, uh, during the winter feeding period. So I'm going to talk about three sets of uh, issues to just set the stage with what the soil and water effects are from feeding cattle um, on pastures during the dormant period uh, that we have in, in the mid-Atlantic uh, part of uh, the United States. And then I'll talk about um, wood chip uh, design, and that's an ag engineering component. And I, I, I failed to mention that I have collaborators from uh, University of Vermont, a biosystems engineer, Joshua Faulkner, and a wood scientist from Duck West Virginia University who worked with uh, wood chip issues on these uh, um, feeding areas. And I'll, I'll go into a little bit of biomass um, preliminary data that, that we've come up with on, on what's suitable to use. So anyway, within the Mid-Atlantic we have uh, uh, about 1.1 million uh, beef brood cows and that's minuscule when you look at you know the plains and, and or, or Texas you know it's like one county in Texas could have um, you know a third of, a third of this uh, uh, population so it's it's not big but it's our main uh, activity um, and our our herd sizes have have increased you know where we've, we've gone from in the last 30 40 years from 15 to 20 head up to now 200 head and so that puts pressure on our on our pastoral systems and and we uh, you know initially we, we fed square bales and we had barn kept animals and we, we moved to round bales and everything went outside and there's some serious impacts with that. So what's a wintering site? It's an area where cattle are fed during the dormant period. Um, sites includes, you know, stored feed. Um, you, you, you have to tram across to feed concentrates with a tractor. Um, sheltered area if, if you need it, calf hutches and a winterized uh, you know, watering system to, to uh, um, complete the, uh, the system. And this is what we get. You know, I, I, I do this talk to, to farmers all the time and, you know, they just nod their head. They see this. They're the, they're the brown donuts in our pastures at the end of the winter. Um, and, you know, here's a beautiful spring picture and you see a, a pasture on the other side that has not been used as a uh, dormant feeding uh, winter area and then one on, on, on this this paddock and uh, the differences are tremendous you know it's uh, they all say that they don't do tillage but they really do this is this is uh, pretty severe tillage in a saturated condition um, so well, you know I go back and it's like the thing is it recovers fast and farmers forget like that, they, you know, they get ground cover again and they're like, hey, everything's okay. And they go on and then they're back in the same situation. So I like to, to use this classic study, um, the Owens et al. I met these guys right before they retired. They're from uh, Coshocton, Ohio. Uh, they had a, a, a wonderful ARS station there that was uh, closed down uh, recently uh, in the last five years but they had monitored watersheds across the place. And, and what they did was they, they uh, did long-term studies, which we don't 
we can't afford to do and which we don't do anymore. But they had a period of from 74 to 86 where they continuously used the pasture. They summer grazed and then they winter fed on it. And then they pulled the cows out and they only grazed during the summer for another period of years. And then the final period, they only harvested hay. And the results, um, they had 60% of their sediment loss occurring during the dormant period. Um, not surprising. But the greatest losses um, were during March to June, um, you know, and they had 40% of their loss during April. And that's when our hydrologic cycle is really letting go. We have a lot of spring rains and, and uh, uh, a, a lot of uh, tillage by the cows. So this is just a, uh, you know, it kind of gives you an idea of precipitation. Precipitation was even across all these years from 74 to 94. There's some, there's some, some uh, um, fuzziness to it, but look at the, the runoff events during this uh, um, 24 or 12 month use period of the pasture where they, where they uh, had cows on it, they had compaction and they increased uh, runoff during that period. And as soon as they pulled the cows off and only had them grazing, those runoff events, even with the same sort of rainfall uh, activity, dropped off, you know, uh, significantly. And then during the hay only, again, there was a, a huge reduction. So we know that, um, you know, it's a, just a nice, um, quantification of the impacts of winter feeding on pasture. And then here's the, the uh, corresponding sediment loss numbers. And as soon as you pull them off, you know, all your sediment losses are during that winter feeding period and are caused from, from that um, in a pasture system. The kicker for me, and this is why I try to tell farmers, is that you're, you're killing your production. You, you, you know, you've got um, here's here's June one, and here's percent. Here's here here's when you're getting back to 100% ground cover, and and through the years there were times when they were well into the growing period and they only had 60% ground um, ground cover. So you know using your 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 money crop as a winter feeding area does you know it's a it's a huge conservation effect to move those cows off of that pasture land in our neck of the woods. And so this is what, what we stole from the, the uh, New Zealanders and, and the Brits and the Scots and the Irish. Um, it's, a, it's an engineered uh, heavy use area. They call them outwintering pads. So if you want to learn about how it's done and what the, the deep research that's been done, go, go look at the British work and, and, and do a search on outwintering pads. So, what you do is we have um, really good clay soils, uh, subsoils, our bee horizon. We just create these, these humps and we put in drainage and we added uh, uh, 57 aggregate stone, a good size um, gravel uh, at, a, at a foot deep. And then we um, added our, our wood chip base uh, to that. And you know, we do have local materials, uh, and that's, a, that's an advantage. We have a lot of uh, uh, eastern hardwoods and a lot of scrap trees that are not um, uh, valuable uh, for the timber industry, so we can chip those up. It's an environmental benefit, but there's some cost and management to it. And, and uh, French over in England, they just wanted to compare cattle performance on in-house versus keeping these cows out on a wood chip pad. And, and basically they found um, that the wood chip pad from feed intake and, and uh, you know, carcass weight, uh, live weight, were all similar or better than, than these other management systems of keeping cows in. And so there was, there's no sort of physical detriment to having cows outside in the weather. So here's a picture of, of the one that we put in. It was a, a very low budget. Uh, we had a conservation district that helped us uh, establish this. Uh, you will notice that it's next to a uh, NRCS heavy um, uh, roofed winter feeding area. So we combined a 
outwintering loafing pad with a feeding area and they do recommend not to feed on these outwintering pads because you'll create too much concentration of manure around the feeding area so you feed somewhere else so there's there's the drainage um, uh, uh, pits and there's the gravel there was a drain pipe that went into those uh, low spots um, you can see our, our deep soils with, uh, um, <laughs> and, and this was the, the out pipe. And so you do have to manage process water. And that scares our farmers because for them, EPA looks at a pastoral system as being benign. And so they say, oh, well, if we pull cows onto a pad, we're creating a point source. But, I mean, the, the economics have to come into play. How much damage are you doing to your resource? So we put in a standard septic tank, and uh, um, within that septic tank, we had a, a pretty nifty little uh, device that was on a pivot. And what it did was it allowed accumulation of effluent um, into the septic tam tank. The, the flout would come up to the to, to, uh, horizontal position, and then it would fill the pipe and it would flop over and empty that, that tank all at once. And that would dose our vegetative treatment center. Um, and there's our, there's our uh, um, vegetative, uh, our dispersal pipe for our vegetative treatment center. We set up, we set up another one um, at our, animal, at our uh, dairy science uh, uh, farm in Morgantown and we just uh, tapped it into the lagoon. So those are your choices. You can either have a, a, a treatment center or put it in a tank where you can spread it. Cows are very happy. Um, they, uh, they had about 50 head and they, they uh, kept these cows um, on this pad for about a 65 day period during the, the highest peak of our hydrologic cycle. So costs, everybody wants to know what, what, what do these things cost? And, and uh, wood chip pad, and this is uh, dollars per cow. Uh, it's, it's reasonably priced. Um, in England, I, I think that they probably cut all their trees down, so it's a little higher cost. Um, and roof to winter, this is the uh, standard roof to winter uh, feeding barn and manure storage is considerably higher. Um, pouring a concrete pad or a gravel pad is uh, the gravel pads about um, uh, the same price or a little bit higher. Uh, stocking density uh, is, is uh, you do have to give the, uh, the cows about 110 feet because you want them to be able to lay down. You want them to be, have comfortable and have, have space um, to, to uh, not be crowded. Um, and, and so these are, these are comparables. These are our NRCS uh, standards that we, that we compared this to because we don't have a lot of uh, um, um, alternatives. So we, uh, we had a very preliminary uh, uh, sampling protocol. We, we, uh, looked, we, we did grab samples at 12 storm events. Um, you know, we'd run up, you know, hour and a half whenever, whenever it looked like we were going to have a runoff event and go grab a sample, um, or the county agent would help us do that. And we had a pressure, pressure t transducer in the, in the septic tank so that we could count how many times that flout raised. And so we knew what, what our um, amount of, of, of uh, outflow was for the, for the system. And we had reasonable numbers. You know, we, it, again, we compared this with uh, um, an earthen uh, uh, pad or a concrete pad, and we were comparable to a concrete pad, and we were much less than an earthen, um, you know, dry lot um, for, for numbers. And, uh, you know, the, the, the Brits have found that uh, uh, you know, their estimation is that 90 to 90 percent of the nitrogen and phosphorus is, is in the manure that's sort of held in this, uh, in this filter bed um, that, that uh, uh, the cows uh, loaf on. 
again with uh, um, looking at uh, um, runoff coefficients. Uh, again, we were, we were uh, um, comparable with um, concrete and we were much better than, than earthen. Um, and you can see, uh, you know, our non-winter periods, what happened was we had rain events that stretched out to longer times um, uh, between the rain events. And so the, the wood chip pad acts as a sponge. And so it, the nice thing is that you don't get an immediate runoff. You get some, some capacity to hold a rainfall event. And then in the, the warm weather, it'll actually evaporate back out. So this kind of shows that with, uh, these, are, these are individual rain events. Uh, the bigger the, the, uh, the circle, the, 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 the higher the amount of, uh, of rain. And, and you can see that um, as, as the duration of dry period, as you, as you have periods of dry between your events, uh, less runoff occurs. So there's that, again, that sponge effect to where um, you, only after you get like repeated rains day in, day out, then you'll st that the system starts to get leaky. So it's, it's, it's kind of a nice um, system to, to moderate runoff. Um, nutrient cycling, what do you do? Well, um, you, you, the recommendations are to have um, a layer of chips that are the filter bed chips in the lower area that are fist size. Okay, and those are difficult to find for us because most American uh, chippers uh, chip a very small chip. And so we're still struggling at finding that, that English style large chip for the base. But on the top, you want a much more comfortable, finer chip for the animal's comfort. And that gets pulled and spread. And, and uh, the English have found that uh, soiled wood chips um, or composted, um, you know, if you, if you apply those, you can get equal uh, yields at the same, um, you know, application of 54 pounds of synthetic N. So you can see there's, there's quite a tie up of, of nitrogen that would be slow release over time, which is kind of nice with a, with a woody product. And like, I'll go back, the, uh, the, the big chips, there's no degradation. So you have to sort of sit and and pull those off after the end of their life, which is about five to seven years. And then it's like, what do we do with those? I'm, I'm still, I'm really curious what the Brits do with the, their big, large uh, chips that you can't spread on the, on the uh, uh, pasture or hayland. So this is just sort of a, a pictorial of uh, um, application rates and, and response over time to that top, per, top portion that has to be managed routinely on the, uh, on the pad. So, you know, there are disadvantages. You have to have, uh, um, um, you know, uh, repeat applications of a, of a thin layer. Um, and and uh, you do have to deal with effluent management. Uh, prolonged freezing is an issue. Or is it not an issue? To me, um, if I've got frozen ground, I'll move my cows out onto frozen ground where they can't destructively tear it up. Um, so to me, it's like get them off the pad and use it strategically in the wet, sloppy weather. Um, and sourcing wood chips, I think that that's uh, a real issue. And I am down to about a minute. Um, so, I'm not going to talk about uh, wood chip um, quality, or uh, but you can come and talk to me about some of our treatments. There's our latest uh, um, pad at the dairy farm, and we are uh, in the process of asking for an interim practice standard uh, for our state, and we just need to continue. Uh, the work and uh, the forestry equipment piece is huge, getting the right chip for this technology. With that, I appreciate your time.
after five years is still fist size, what determines that it's exceeded its lifespan? The, the, the permeability or the functionality of the pad is, no, is so clogged with manure at that point that you have to pull it out and, and you have to have a flow through system. It, once it clogs up, it'll just start ponding. So every five years you have to refresh that entire bed? Uh, yes. The That's right, yeah.